Uh, welcome to this talk. Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Giuseppe D'Angelo. I work at KDAB. Uh, this morning, yes, it's Sunday morning, hangover. I know that big party celebrations yesterday in the evening. Uh, but I'd like still to talk a little bit to you and introduce a few concepts around multi-threading with Qt. Uh, in particular, if you Google just for random documentation about Qthread, uh, there is a lot of things going on. How am I supposed to really use Qthread? What can I do? What can I not do? What should I not do? Uh, so with this short talk, I hope to just tell you the whole story and convince you that yes, there are certain things that you can freely do and certain things that it's better if you don't go that way and other things that you really should never do in your Qt application. So this talk will be basically about uh, the plumbing, the low level threading in Qt. Uh, Qt has also higher level APIs for threading, starting from Qt concurrent, uh, future, etc. And there is also an even higher level library built around Qt, which is called Threadweaver. There, is, there are other talks at this conference about these higher level things, so I'm not going to introduce them in this talk as well. If you're re really interested in those topics, please go watch the videos or go to those talks. So what we're going to see in this talk is really, again, the plumbing. I'm going to talk a little bit about Qthread, what it is, what it's used for, how you're supposed to use it. I'm going to talk a, bit, a little bit about synchronization and how we achieve that when using Qt and Qt primitives. And of course, with problem synchronization, we've got the problem of thread safety. What are the things that are thread safe in Qt? How we know what things are thread safe and how we work around certain things which are thread unsafe, but still we can do them in Qt. And time permitting, I also got a few slides at the end about how do I mix Qt and standard library thread facilities. So the whole story is that Qt comes before C++11 and we already got support for threads and synchronization and all the like. But then of course C++11, 14, 17 are coming around and they're introducing more and more and more threading facilities in the C++ language itself. So how can we mix and match both? Uh, can, can we and how? Uh, so I got a few slides at the end that just tell us a bit of like a comparison of what we can do and what we can expect from one or the other. Okay, so let's get started. First and foremost, do you know what a thread is? That's going to make my life terribly simpler. Yes, so who knows what a thread is? Raise your hands. Okay, great. You know. <laughs> so you know what a thread is, so I'm not going to tell you that. Uh, I'm going to tell you what a what we manage, how we manage threads in Qt, and that's by using that class, which is called Qthread. So what's Qthread? Uh, Qthread is basically the central class in Qt to run code in a different thread. Fair enough, we got a class, and we can use that to run start threads and run code in a separate thread. In particular, Qthread is a Q object subclass. Uh, there are good sides of this and bad sides of this. Uh, the good side is that it has signals that notify us when that thread is basically started and finished. We can listen to those signals and know what a thread is doing. And the real deal here is that Qthread itself is meant to manage a thread. That's why it got those signals. So I create a Qthread and that's my handler for another thread. I'm not supposed to add logic to the Qthread itself to do something, but we'll see about that. But being a Qobjet subclass, this also means it's not copyable, but it's not also movable. And that's already some difference, for instance, with the C11 standard thread, which instead is movable. So, how do I use Qthread? Oh, that's quite simple. I simply subclass Qthread and re implement a function, which is called run. I have a next slide, an example of that. In run, I put the code which is supposed to be run in the new thread. Fair enough. Then what I do, I create an instance of this subclass and I call start on it, not run, I call start on it. What start is going to do is generate the new thread and the new thread calls run. Yeah. And also Qthread uh, supports priorities of threads. So when I call start, I actually pass a priority to it and have a thread run, for instance, with a lower priority or with a higher priority if I have the right privileges. So a small example, can you read that? Should be fairly big, yeah. Small example, I got a class, my thread, public Qthread, so I'm a Qthread subclass. I override the run method, and I put in there some code that needs to be run in the new thread. 
And then I create an instance of my class somewhere else by using new my thread and I call start on it. That basically starts a new thread and the new thread will call run. And sometime later, I'd like to know when this thread is finished. Well, in which case I can synchronize with the end of the training by calling wait on it. So I've got another method, which is the equivalent of join or call it whatever you want in other APIs. That thread, that method waits for the thread to end. Yep. So when this thread wait call returns, I know that the thread has finished running. Okay. Well, yeah, that's pretty much what you could expect for any thread like API in any programming language. So how does the thread finish running? When it returns from run? Yep. I can know when the thread is running, not only by listening to the signals, but also by just checking. I can call qthread is running or qthread is finished, and those will provide me information about has the thread just, has the thread been started? Yes. Has the thread finished? Not yet. So I can check that. I also got extra uh, ancillary functions, for instance, qthread sleep, that I can use to just make a thread sleep for a certain amount of time. That's generally a bad idea. You should never sleep in your code, explicitly at least. You should always aim for some kind of event-driven or polling design. Uh, forcing a thread to sleep means you should probably not be using a thread in the first place. Yeah, and finally, yes, you can call wait on a queue thread, and that means please wait for the thread to finish. So that sounds simple. Yeah, where comes the, comp the complicated part? There are a few uh, caveats when coming to Qthread programming. There is a certain number of things that you cannot do or a certain number of things that you must ensure you're doing the right way. In particular, when using Qt from any non-main thread, which means from any thread which is not the thread that started in your main function, you cannot perform any GUI operation whatsoever. You're not allowed to touch or create any QWidget API, including all QWidget subclasses, of course, you're not allowed to touch any QTWIC API. You're not allowed to touch any QPixMap kind of things. Basically, anything that involves somehow interacting with the window manager is forbidden. You cannot do that at all. Yep. What, however, you can do is using GUI code, which does not touch the window manager. So for instance, QImage, QPainter, uh, those things, QFont, those things that are actually client side, that are just like inside your application, then that's totally safe to do in a thread. So it's totally safe to have a Q thread, which for instance generates a Q image, that's, I don't know, calculates uh, the image itself the, to visualize the Mandelbrot set. And then once the image is generated in a separate thread, passes it over to the main thread for visualization. Yep. How about OpenGL? Well, this is my third talk here, and I keep talking about OpenGL. OpenGL and threading has also issues. You must check at runtime if your particular platform supports threaded OpenGL. So there is a, a function call you can make to know if you're allowed to touch OpenGL in a separate queue thread or you're not allowed at all. And there is, that, there is such a functionality in Qt itself. And another thing you cannot possibly do for a non-main thread is call Q core application exec or Q GUI application exec you're not allowed to start the main thread event loop from a non-main thread. Now, this is kind of corner case, but uh, for instance, if you're implementing, if you're using Qt as a plugin in a bigger application, which is not Qt-based, you may find yourself into calling that in a separate thread. Well, you're not allowed to do that, period. Only the main thread can call exec. Something else you should not do is you, want, you do not ever want to block the UI thread. So actually, if you start a separate thread, you almost never want to call wait on the thread, unless you're fairly certain that thread has already finished. The reason is quite simple. If you stop the main thread from running, your UI will freeze. You will get no event processing whatsoever, so the user all sees is a stuck window. It can't click anything, it cannot type anything into it, and after a couple of seconds, also your window manager is going to tell you, this application has stopped working, do you want to kill it? So. Whatever you do, do not block the main thread waiting for other threads. And last but not least, if in secondary threads you create queue objects, you must be sure to destroy all queue objects before destroying the corresponding queue thread instance. So this sounds like an arbitrary limitation. Well, there is a limit, there is a reason that for that in Qt, it will become clear uh, in a few slides. But basically, you must be sure that 
Every time you create a key object in a separate thread, for instance inside run, you must also destroy that object before destroying the queue thread. What does this mean in practice? How do I solve that? In practice, I mean, it means I need to do one of these three things. Either I'm going to create these key objects straight in the queue thread run stack. So when that, when I return from run, it means, of course, the automatic variables on that stack are going to be destroyed. And therefore, that's not a problem. I can also use uh, a nice trick, which is connecting the finished signal from the thread to the delete later slot that any key object has. And although that seems a bit strange, so how can that work? The thread is finishing. I'm telling when it finishes, delete the object later, but there is no later, the thread is finished, right? Well, not worry, that works. It's special code and in Qt application. Or you can do something which is moving this object out of the thread. Uh, we'll see what move means, but just to introduce it uh, right now, uh, any key object has an idea of the thread it has been created into. So if I create an object in a given thread, the object remembers, yes, I leave that thread. And what I can do is saying to the object, no, you don't belong to that thread anymore, now you belong to another thread, and that's also safe. So as an example of all these three things, this is again another thread. In run, I can create a few objects on the stack like that. Those are safe to create because when run returns, the destructors for those objects will, of course, be called because they're on the stack. Or I can create an object and put it into a smart pointer. So this is an object that I create only if a certain condition is true. I don't always create it, but it doesn't matter. Its lifetime is managed by that pointer, by that smart pointer. It's like a unique pointer if you want. So again, when the run returns, the smart pointer will clean up the point D and therefore destroy the object. Or I can use this connect trick over here. So I got a third object. This is really allocated via new, but I am not putting in a smart pointer for whatever reason. And what I do is that connection between Qthread finished and delete later here. That also ensures deletion of the object. And finally, what I can do here is that I create yet another Q object. I do something, and before quitting the thread, I move this object to another thread. So I tell that object, you don't belong to this thread anymore, you belong to another thread. For instance, in this case, I'm moving it back to the main thread. After I do that, of course, I need to tell the main thread, yeah, now you got this object, please ensure deletion at the proper time. But also, I, I am not allowed to, talk, to touch that object anymore. The second I, I write that line, it also means I do not own that object anymore. Now, for instance, the main thread can delete it immediately, the line after that one. So I'm really not supposed to touch it anymore. Yep, so that's kind of easy. Now, when it comes to Qthread itself, uh, there are basically two main ways you may want to use it. One is without running ML loops in separate threads, and the other one is, of course, running ML loops in a separate thread. What does this mean? Well, the usage without an event loop is the usage we just saw. If we don't need any event-driven design in a separate thread, I just subclass Qthread, override Qthread run, and then I start it. Just like that. Yep. So suppose I have some heavy calculation to do in a separate thread. I just create a Qthread instance, put some code into run, and then I just start a new thread, wait for it to finish, and this thread loads some files from disk, does some calculations, save the results, those are heavy operations, and I want to block my UI thread for this kind of stuff. Yep. However, there is also another usage, which is, however, required every time you need some kind of event loop design. So for instance, every time you're dealing with timers, with networking, with queued connections, every time you need an event loop running, Qthread actually supports this. So the whole story is this. Uh, Qt supports pair thread event loops. Any Q thread that you start, including the main thread, can spin its own event loop. And that local event loop simply delivers events to objects living into that thread. Yeah, so I can have, this is my main thread over here. There are a few objects inside of it, and that's delivering events for those objects. Those objects are typically, I don't know, widgets, stuff like that. But I can also have ancillary threads, thread A and thread B, in which I create additional key objects for instance, a network connection, a TCP socket, and I get the thread deliver events to that socket, otherwise the socket just doesn't work. 
Yep. So how can I achieve these other things instead? Uh, it's quite simple. From within run, all I need to do is call exec. So within Qthread, I subclass Qthread again, and somewhere inside run, I call exec. Exec means start the event loop for this particular thread. So if I'm, for instance, there's a socket around here, this socket will need, oh sorry, this socket will need an event loop to be running. I call exec, exec actually starts the event loop, so now the socket is functional. How do I stop exec? So I do a return from exec. Well, there are two functions I can use, qthread quit or qthread exit, and those will basically make exec return. Yeah, so I can do my connections, I can do whatever I want in order to call these functions, and these functions ensure thread, the thread exiting from the, its own local event loop. Another strategy, which is, of course, a bit more low level, is we can still use QEvent loop, which is a class which wraps an event loop. I can also call manually Q core application process events. I can do anything I want, basically, to have a, a thread dispatch events inside of it. The point is that you can, and there are scenarios in which you must do that, for instance, if you have a timer inside your thread. Timers only work via events, so you must have an event loop running. Yep. And something kind of peculiar, which is somehow new in Qt, only from Qt 4 or 5, or something like that, is that if you don't re-implement run, the default implementation actually calls exec. So what you can do is that you can have some kind of event-driven event -driven, uh, work done, even without subclassing Qthread at all. So let's have a look here. I got a Qthread and a worker object, which does some work, some heavy work, and I want to run this work in a thread. What I can do is basically do some kind of clever connection, like this. I can connect the started signal from the thread to the do worker slot of the worker, so when the thread starts, the worker starts doing some work. I can connect the work done signal from the worker to the quit slot of the queue thread. So when the worker has finished done something, the thread will eventually exit. And then I also connect, again, the finished signal of the thread to the delete le later slot of the worker, in case I need the worker also to delete itself once it's done. And then, again, a, a bit of magic for now, I call boot thread to say this worker now lives into that thread, so the event, event dispatch of that worker will be done inside the thread, and then I start the thread. Yep, this allows me to have this kind of job-like operation without subclassing Qthread at all. And this still works. Okay, so this is basically an introduction to Qthread, it's a nice API. Let's talk a little bit about synchronization that is the other companion APIs that Qt must, of course, provide in order to make Qthread effective. So, pop quits. What is the single most important thing about threads? Yes? Sorry? They do some processing and parallel with everything else. Well, that's technically false, so that's not the most important things about threads. <laughs> no, they're really, the most important single thing as soon as you introduce threads in your application is? Sorry? Synchronization, yes. Or better, you must not do any data race. A data race is officially defined into the standard now, because the standard talks about threads, and the, must, the single most important thing is that any concurrent access to shared resources, when you start using threads, of course, otherwise you don't have any concurrent access whatsoever, must not result in a data race. So there are basically two conditions for this to happen. This is defined into the C++ 11 standard and, of course, the subsequent ones, is that whenever you access a shared resource, you will have a data race if, first, at least one of the accesses is a write. If you're just reading, that's no problem whatsoever, but as long as, as soon as you have at least one write to it, then you risk a data race. And the second condition is that these accesses are not atomic, and no access happens before the other. That's happens before is literally what you find, what's written into the standard. That means that basically there is some kind of ordering of this access that you can prove that they will happen in a defined order and therefore not result in a data race. 
In practice, this means we will need primitives, we will need help to either obtain atomic rights or either obtain this kind of synchronization of something that happens before something else. And this means we will need synchronization primitives. So cute ships with a bunch of them, all the low level ones, basically everything that you want. We got uh, mutexes, Q mutex, we got semaphores, or counting mutexes if you want. We got a weight condition, which is a condition variable. Uh, we got a shared mutex, which is a read-write lock, a lock that can be locked many times for reading, but only once for writing. And also we got atomics. So we got, for instance, Q-atomic int, which is an atomic integer, uh, Q-atomic pointer t, which is an atomic pointer to t. And we can use these to basically ensure that accesses to shared resources are, are probably synchronized. In addition to those, we got also a bunch of helpers. For instance, we got Q-mutex locker, which is a RAII class that wraps a mutex. It will acquire the mutex as soon as you create a Q-mutex locker instance and will release the mutex when you destroy the Q-mutex locker. And that's basically the only way that you can probably be sure that you release the lock in all exit paths out of the function. So let's see an example of when, how, and I'm interested to use mutexes or synchronization. Suppose that I have a thread, the, this thread does some work, and from the main thread, I'd like to say this, to tell this thread, uh, please stop whatever you're doing. I'd like to cancel you right now. Yep. A very simple way of doing this is, okay, I introduce an M cancel member, it's a Boolean. When I start this guy, it's of course not canceled, so it's false. Yep. In my thread run, I keep asking, am I cancelled? No, then, okay, keep doing whatever you're doing. And this basically, am I cancelled, just returns the value of am cancelled. And the GUI, whenever it wants to cancel this thread, calls cancel, and that sets that variable to true. So what is the problem with this code? Yeah. So there's, yes? On, on the flip side, the worst that's going to happen, surely, is that we'll do something on our two times extra. Uh, 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 I'm sorry, can you repeat that again? On the flip side, okay, the, the thread might not notice it's been cancelled until a bit later. Okay, so his observation is, uh, the worst that could happen is that uh, the thread notices that it gets cancelled sometime later. Uh, this is unfortunately wrong for two reasons. Uh, first and foremost, as soon as you do uh, an, an unsynchronized write, that's undefined behavior. So the application is allowed technically to do anything at all. Second, th uh, second, there are compilers which actually can exploit the fact that they prove you're, you're doing synchronized uh, un undefined behavior and then literally replace your code with anything else. <laughs> we, we, we got bugs in the Linux kernel because people were relying on this to happen and the compiler was outsmarting the developer. And third, actually, uh, there is no timeline, there, is, there are no guarantees that a second thread, that a second core, a second CPU will possibly see that variable to become true, no matter how long you wait. You need one CPU to tell the other CPU, please flush your cache, please, th this variable you're poking is not the same value, and if that message does not pass between the CPUs, then the second CPU will never see it. So uh, actually, it's not guaranteed that it will eventually happen. It's really the worst possible thing ever. So yes, this thing, this read, this write, and this read need synchronization. Is it enough to mark this guy as volatile? No, right? Volatile is not for atomic access or synchronization. Uh, it is on Microsoft. It's not anywhere else. So we will need something. Either I make this kind atomic. Or simpler, I introduce a mutex. So I add a member, Q mutex over there, and in cancel, I acquire the mutex by using one of those classes, by using one of those lock managers, Q mutex locker. This acquires the mutex, and then I'm, it's safe to write into this guy. And this guy over here, also when I read it out, I acquire the same mutex, and then copy the value out. Yep, so basically this read and this write are now protected by the same mutex and everything is fine. Yep. 
Yes, there is a question over there. Would it be enough in this case to use STD atomic? Yes, so in this particular case, yes, we could have used an atomic Boolean as well and just use a relaxed read and write. Uh, but yes, you know, in general, it's, it, this is the most general purpose solution, so you, you will need some kind of locking. So this basically ensures that the access is not atomic, but they happen one before the other. So I'm, the condition for a data race is not satisfied. This is not a data race, and I'm fine with that. Or I can make the access atomic, which again makes the second condition for a data race not happening. Yeah. Okay. Now, this particular feature, this cancellation, is actually built in Qthread. This is a small feature I was not telling you before. Qthread has request interruption and is interruption requested. Uh, it's already built in, it does the right thing and uses an atomic. It does not use uh, uh, mutexes. So inside my run method, I can actually call something like is interruption requested. So I poke this interruption request and if that's true, okay, I return out of run, which means the, the thread will eventually end. Otherwise I keep doing something and Perhaps if this doing something is very, very short, I want to check this interruption request only around the number of iterations. And I think now this should not be equal. This, oh yeah, it's, it's equal, it's fine. Okay, another pop quiz. Do I need to protect this M cancel false? The initialization of M cancel with a, with a, with a mutex. So remember this guy? Why is this M cancel here not protected by mutex? That's a write into it. Yes, sorry, can, can you say that? Yes, so, that, so there is no second thread whatsoever. This is the constructor we run. There is only the thread which is creating this guy. There is nothing to synchronize against. There is no data race, true. Also, this is the constructor again, so I don't even have this object because I'm still building it. I'm inside the constructor, I cannot possibly start it because I don't have the object built just yet. True. But then how come that this false is visible from, from here, from the second thread? Is there a happens before relation? Is this a write which conflicts with this read? Yeah, this is when multi-training becomes fun, right? Well, you can't run it, so. Yes, but suppose I run this constructor, then I call run, and run calls is cancelled, and I read it out. So now you've got a write and a read, and where is my happens before relation? Well, you can't call run until the Yep, yep, and actually, yes, so that's true. So anything that happens during run happens after anything that happens in the constructor. And there is also not, yes, so everything that happens when I call run happens after I call the, I, the constructor as run, as finished running, that's true. And there is also a second condition for that, which is when you start a new thread, that also happens before relation. There is a synchronization point when you spawn a new thread, and the new thread is guaranteed to see all the writes that happened before it. That's how you ensure that the two threads are now on the same page, basically. So yes, you don't need to protect M cancel faults in the constructor. Don't worry about that. Okay, so this is basically a general purpose idea of how we synchronize things in Qt. Let's talk a little bit of what parts of Qt are thread safe and what need synchronization. Now, if you open Qt documentation, you will find these, the following definitions. Uh, they are not universal in literature, so I'm being honest with you with this. If you open another book, you may find a slightly different definition. So I'm giving you the ones that you find inside of Qt. Please adapt them to other people thinking slightly differently. So a function is defined to be thread safe in Qt if, it's in, if you can invoke that function at the same time for multiple threads with, on the same data, so on the same arguments, without any synchronization from your side. That's the definition of thread-safe function in Qt. 
And that's pretty much what you, what would uh, you expect out of a thread safe function. It's totally safe to call it no matter what are the arguments and I don't need to do anything about it. Yeah. A function is said to be reentrant if the function itself is safe to be invoked at the same time for multiple threads, but on different data. If I'm trying to call it on the same data, I must ensure synchronization myself. It becomes my burden, my responsibility. But if it's on different data, then it's absolutely fine. Yep. And finally, a function can also be non-reentrant or a thread unsafe. And that means you, can, you are not allowed to call that function from more than one thread at all. You can call that function only from one specific thread. So these definitions are about functions, but you can have the same definitions about member functions or methods. In particular, it's quite simple. You just consider them when invoked on the same instance. So if you consider the, this parameter as a parameter to the function, then the same reasoning applies. You've got methods which are thread safe, methods which are reentrant, methods which are non reentrant So let's have an example of them. Uh, of thread safe methods or classes, uh, a class QMutex is obviously thread safe. I would expect that to be, otherwise it's quite a pointless. Something more interesting, QObject Connect is thread safe. So you can call connect on the same objects from different threads, that's totally safe. Yeah, you can pass the same arguments to it, including senders and receivers from multiple threads. It doesn't matter, it's thread safe. Uh, queue application post event, that is the function to use to queue a new event inside queue 7 loop, that's also thread safe. You can call it from whatever thread you want. Yep. About reentrant functions or classes, uh, queue string, queue vector, the containers, queue image, uh, all the value classes in queue are basically just reentrant. What does this mean? It means that if I got a queue string, I can call methods on it from one thread. If I got another queue string, I can call methods on it from another thread. But on the same queue string, I am I'm not allowed to call methods from different threads. So on the same object, I am not allowed to touch it from multiple threads. If I do so, I require external synchronization. I require a mutex around the string. Different strings, doesn't matter. Yep, or different vectors, different images, different value classes in general. And non-reentrant, well, that's, all, that's of course the funny ones, uh, widgets, cute quick stuff, pixmaps, all of those that basically are usable only from the main thread. So you're not allowed to touch them at all from secondary threads. How do I figure out if something is reentrant, thread safe, non-reentrant? Uh, in Qt, we have a solution for that. You open the documentation. How many of you open the documentation? Yeah. So, okay, so someone actually reads the documentation that we write so, so patiently. And well, basically when you open it, there is a note in the documentation, I don't know if you can read it, which says, yeah, all the functions in this class are reentrant. So you know that what you can expect given a class or a method or something like that. Unless otherwise specified, everything is non-reentrant. So don't, so please assume the worst and then perhaps you open the source code or you file in a bug request saying, Actually, that method is thread safe. You should document it as such. Yep. How about key object? Is key object thread safe? Is key object reentrant? Is key object itself non reentrant? Good question. Uh, it's complicated, someone would say. So the full story is this key object itself is thread aware. As I told you before, key object has an idea of in which thread has been created into. In particular, it remembers this information and can ask for that information by calling key object thread. And what we say is that any given key object basically lives in a thread or has affinity with a thread, meaning it was created into the, that thread. What we can do is that we can make key object change its mind and basically make it belong to another thread by calling move to thread. So I can create a key object in a given thread, and then I can tell it, no, please move to this other thread. So it, it's, its own idea about which, trends is, which, which thread it belongs to changes. And this thread-aware thing causes headaches. 
because key object is technically reentrant according to the documentation. However, if I'm using something which is event based, that's not reentrant. So timers, sockets uh, are not reentrant. You cannot call queue timer start from the thread the timer is not leaving into at the moment. If you do so, you just get random warnings on the console. The event dispatching for any key object happens in the thread it has affinity with, which means that at any given time, you may have that thread, the thread that the key object is living in, dispatching event for that object, which means calling functions on that object. So inside the key object, you may have code called by the event, plus call called from any other thread that you may be managing, and that can cause races inside the queue itself. So if you got event dispatching going on, you're basically preparing yourself for doom if you also touch that object for another thread. There is also another requirement. Uh, all the key objects in the same parent child tree must have the same thread affinity. I'm not allowed to build a parent child tree of objects with objects leaving in different threads. And this basically means you cannot create key objects on inside a queue thread run and parent them to the queue thread itself. That's because the queue thread itself was created in the main thread. The new object is created in the new thread. You can establish a parent child relation between them. As I told you before, you must delete all the objects leaving inside the thread. So actual destruction, destruction is not thread safe. And you can only call move to thread to move an object from one thread to another from the very same thread the object belongs to. So in other words, move to thread is not reentrant. It must be called from one specific thread. So with all these limitations in mind, to me, it's just far easier if I think that key object is non reentrant I can only touch key object from the thread it lives in, and that helps me avoiding all sorts of mistakes. Yep. So every time I mix key objects and threads, I'm very, very sure that I move objects to the right threads and touch those objects only from within those threads. Sorry. Sorry, can you wait for the microphone if they, if, because otherwise nobody else can hear you and we're also recording this session so you can, people can know what I'm. Is it a really bad idea to move the queue thread object to its own thread, to the thread it's managing? It is an indication of very poor design because you're not making the clear, uh, you're not making this managing thing clear. You're saying that, yes, I manage this thread, but I also live into it, so I'm supposed to be deleted when I'm finished. So I'm supposed like to commit suicide or something like that. Uh, it, it's, a, it's very important, it's a, I mean, it will work, possibly. Uh, I don't recommend using it. I mean, if I spot that in the code, it's an indication that you did not have very clear who's managing the thread and what the thread is doing. And those are typically two different tasks. You're just trying to mix everything together into one. Uh, and again, sounds bad when you read the code. In practice, it will possibly work. Uh, we're still deciding if we should like emit a warning or tell you, are you really sure about that? Doesn't sound like a good, I mean, good idea. So please don't do that, please. Okay. Sorry? Uh, move a thread into itself. Do thread move to thread? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it works. Yeah. So we know it works, but again, okay, it's poor, poor practice. So this discussion about key object and thread reality brings up a, a question: uh, If a key object is non entrant how can I communicate with a key object living in another thread? So if I got an object living in some other thread. I cannot call a, a method on it because I told you the object is not reentrant. I cannot call a method on it from another thread. How can I communicate with it? Well, Qt offers a solution which is and goes under the name of cross-thread signals slots or queue demarcations or something like that. Okay, sorry. Okay, yeah, we're still alive. Good. Uh, so the way this cross-thread signal slot work, works is very, very simple. You can emit a signal from one thread, any thread, and have the slot invoked by another thread. 
but not just any thread in your application. You can have the slot invoked by the same thread the receiver object is living in, which is, by the way, the right thread that can do that. Yep. And the way this works is this. Basically, automatically, if I got a receiver end of a connection living in a different thread than the thread that emits the signal, then the connection will be automatically queued for us by queued. And this means that all this magic will happen. Under the hood, what happens is this. Uh, queued will detect that you are in this scenario and do this. Basically, we'll just post an event into that thread's event queue, into the receiver's event queue. And that event in the receiver's end, uh, event queue is basically something called a meta call event. It means invoke this slot. OK. However, this also means since there is an event going on, the receiver must live in a thread which has a running event loop. Otherwise, it will never see the event coming. Yep. So this is a, this is a very strong argument for making your thread design event-based, if possible, rather than just non-event loop-based. If you make them event-based, then you can communicate freely between threads by just connecting things together and sending signals. A small catch, if you're passing arguments to those signals, you also need to call that QRegister meta type function, because basically Qt must know how to build and destroy uh, the arguments of your signal. Don't worry too much. If you forget about that, you just get a warning on the console telling you you forgot to type QRegister meta type. You do that, and your application works. And last, lastly, almost, now I have an example, uh, you can force any connection to be queued. So QObject Connect has actually five arguments. Uh, the fifth one is almost never used. It means auto-connection, do the right thing. But you can also force a connection to be either direct, so to bypass this mechanism, or to be queued, even if it happens inside the same thread. So let's have an example. I got a thread here. This thread run basically is a consumer for something which gets built by a producer. So I actually, when I build the thread, I pass the producer into it, so it knows what the producer is. And inside the run, I create a consumer on the stack. It's local. It gets destroyed nicely. I connect the producer, a unit produce signal to the consumer consume slot, and then I call exec. Oh, sorry. What's happening? Yep. Yep, and then in the main thread, I have my producer, I have my thread, and I start the thread. And this does, this hooks it up and makes everything work. This connect statement, remember that Object Connect is thread safe, so I'm allowed to call it even if producer is not leaving that particular thread. So this connect statement is absolutely fine, but this code has a bug. Can you spot the bug? No, you cannot. OK. <laughs> well, there is a small thing here, which is somehow assuming that run runs immediately. What happens if, over here, producers start producing things? This connection may not have been set up by that time, right? I've got no guarantees that run is doing something until I check for that, basically. So this code basically can make Run, can make the consumer miss a few units produce signals. Yep, because the connection is not established yet. The connection happens in here. So what I can do, something more stronger, is actually, again, getting rid of the subclass and do everything event-based, like this. I can create a producer, I can create a consumer, I create a thread, one, two, three. I connect. Again, the producer to the consume. Yep, so this works. And I can also connect the thread finished to the consumer delete later. So again, I'm sure that the consumer is gone when the thread is gone. I move the consumer to the thread. So I tell the consumer, you now live in that thread. And I start the thread. And thread is now a plain Q-thread subclass. This, this, yes, sorry. A question of it? Many questions. Okay. Many questions. Yes. 
It's because I'm stupid, I need to ask a lot of questions. Um, but the consumer is now in the thread, and the thread isn't. I, I'm sorry? When, when you connected the threads finished to the consumer's delete later, Yes. they were, they were both objects in, this, in the present thread. Yes. And so it'll have been connected as a, as as a, a, direct. a direct, deliver it directly. Okay. But when you moved it to thread, does that, re, does that get rerouted so it will go via the event? Okay, y yes, thank you for that question. So the question is about these connections are now happening in the main thread, then I move stuff to different threads, what happens then, if I got that correctly? Yes. So, uh, whether a connection is queued or direct is a decision that happens at signal emission time. Uh, unless you force it, of course. If you force it, it's there and will never change. But this connection here, they're all auto connections, to, so to say, and only when the signal is actually emitted, I go to check, is this signal emitted in the same thread the receiver is living in? If yes, it's direct, otherwise, it's queued. And I can move the receiver around all the time, basically, and the connection will change type according to that. So that works, basically. Okay. Was somebody else raised his hand? Their hands? No, okay. Okay, so this basically is the same example as before, but without races, so without the risk that the producer produces something and the consumer does not see that, and without the need of subclassing cuter at all. I just create a plain Q thread. Or I can do this. Suppose that I got a thread which emits a signal. Is this safe to do? So suppose that I got this thread, I connect the thread, my signal, to a receiver, and the receiver is leaving in some other thread. Do you think this is safe to do? Sorry? I, 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 no exact, therefore the, the, the event can't Yeah, there is no exec, but this thread is not actually receiving signals. This thread is emitting signals now. So what happens if I got a signal basically emitted from run? So a signal emitted from another thread. Do you think this is safe to do? And this will work? Yeah, that's the big question now. <laughs> this is safe to do. This will work. Uh, because as I was just saying, signal emission just means uh, the signal emission is checked at signal emission time. So whether this connection is queued or direct, actually the check happens when this line of code is reached. So when I emit the signal, Qt will check, is the signal emitted from the same thread this receiver object, oh gosh, sorry, this receiver object is living in? The answer may be yes, maybe no, I don't know where the receiver object is living in, but nonetheless, I'm going to do the right thing. So if it's, if it's living inside the queue thread, then it's a direct connection. If it's living in some other thread, then it's a queued connection. This is totally safe to do. And there is no need of an event run, an event loop running inside this thread because it's not receiving signals, it's emitting signals. Yep. So it is perfectly okay to add signals to queue thread. The connection is queued if receiver is not there. Suppose the receiver is in the main thread, and so some slot will be picked up and invoked by the main thread event loop. How about the opposite? This is a very common pattern. Uh, I subclass Q thread again, I create a socket class, I try to connect that socket, so I do this. Connect them socket signal connected to a slot local which is this, my thread unconnected. Then I tell the socket, please go ahead, try to connect to some host, and when you're connected, you will fire that signal and I will know that. And inside unconnected, I do something like QDebug and, oh yes, I'm connected, this is the data that the socket has received. Is this safe to do? Ha ha ha, okay, yes, you've been beaten by this before. So this, unfortunately, is not safe to do. What is the catch? The catch is that when this signal is emitted, I'm going to check, sorry, I'm going to check which, which thread emitted connected against this. I guess the thread, the Q thread itself lives in. 
And those would be typically different because the queue thread itself is, has been created in the main thread, for instance. The socket has been created in the managed thread. So this connection is going to be queued. This slot is going to be invoked from the main thread or from whatever thread this queue thread is living into. And for that reason, now I'm accessing M socket and that's not safe to do. I cannot touch M socket from the, from the main thread. So queue thread is a queue object, as such has its own thread affinity, which is typically not the one of the thread it's managing. Please don't solve this problem by writing thread, move to thread itself, move to thread this. That's very bad idea to do. And the connection is queued because the thread that emits the signal, the thread that calls connected is not the same thread as this is living into. So the connection will be figured out, okay, this is going to queue the connection and slot will be invoked from the wrong thread. So the huge recommendation is please do not add slots to queue thread. Try to avoid this design as much as possible. If you just don't override run, then you don't have that problem whatsoever. But if you do that, then please be careful. Please try to split your design into a worker class that does all the work and queue thread, which just manages the thread, sets up the worker and launches it. Don't mix basically thread management and logic. Yes. Uh, also uh, connecting to a lambda? Yes. Uh, so if you connect to a lambda, uh, well, if you, you, so if you connect to a lambda, you can use three arguments or four arguments. Uh, there is a version of queue object connect which takes basically sender, signal, context object, lambda, or functor. That context object is used to check in which thread that lambda is going to be invoked. So the check is still done, even if the context object has nothing to do with lambda itself, but the check will be still be done. So you, you can have queued connection against lambdas. You just need this extra parameter, which is the check to do, basically. OK. So that's the recommendation, basically. How much time have I left? Five minutes? Ten, Ten minutes? Seven. Seven minutes. OK. So uh, OK, I'm, yes, I, ex I expected I don't have much time to go through this, but uh, uh, C++11 introduces its own standard library threading facilities. Can we use them in a Qt application? How about, because uh, the deal is that the standard library is increasing the number of stuff uh, of the concurrent stuff inside of it, Qt is not. So it's likely that people will want to move towards some library in the very next future. And the good news is this, it is perfectly possible and it works to mix Qt and standard library trend classes. You can use both inside the same application, it will just work. Uh, the standard library, as I told you, uh, is moving extremely fast. There are proposals for a lot of parallel things and Qt will not catch up its development ever. It's just impossible. So don't expect Qt wrappers for all of this. Uh, we already got technical specification TS for parallel algorithms, continuations, latches, barriers, atomic smart pointers, executors, concurrent queues, distributor counters, coroutines, all the buzzwords that you can imagine. Those are all parallel multi-threaded related concepts. Qt will not implement any of those, I'm afraid. So please don't expect Qt to do those. Start moving towards the standard library if you need any of that. The other important thing is that uh, more and more tooling will start checking for court usages of standard APIs, not Qt ones, unless we re-implement Qt ones on top of the standard library ones. In practice, this means there are already tools out there that can check, for instance, uh, that your mutex locking is accurate and you're not running into deadlocks or you cannot possibly run into deadlocks. We already got things such as Hellgrind, which is a tool from, provided by Valgrind. And this tool can see when you use the standard track with a standard lock. They cannot see Qmutex. They don't recognize Qt as a thing. So actually now they do, but they just, because Qt got, uh, Qt Atomics, for instance, got re-implemented on top of C++11 Atomics. So unless Qt moves on top of the standard library facilities, don't expect tooling to catch up with Qt. And in the end, Qt thread 
uh, is still more convenient when you deal with key object and event loops because the standard library has no idea what an event loop is. So if you're using event loops as you should be using, QZ is still more convenient. And okay, I've got a quick comparison of APIs right now, so I'm just going through these slides, but you can download them so you have a better idea. Uh, in particular, there are some features that Qthread has, some threads does not have. Uh, for instance, uh, Qthread, both Qthread and some thread, there is no need to subclass them in order to use it. On the other hand, uh, Qthread does not have a function job API. We cannot have just a function tell Qthread bounded function, which is exactly what some thread does. We're missing a function on Qthread make thread or something like that. We're still missing it. There'll be a discussion later on today about that. Uh, it's a missing API. Uh, standard thread has a detached support. We can detach a thread, which means basically have the standard thread, have the manager lose track of the manager thread. Qthread does not have anything like that, but we can somehow emulate that. Uh, Qthread has that interruption request. Standard thread does not have it, but the slide that I just shown you can be used to implement the same functionality inside standard thread. And even more, uh, Qthread has event loops. Standard thread does not, because the standard has no idea what an event loop is. But I can just use Q event loop instead of standard thread, and that will work. I can create Q objects into both Q threads and standard threads. There's no problem. I, I can even move objects into standard thread. Uh, the idea is very simple, is that there is a function in Qt, which is called Qthread current thread. And that returns a dummy Qthread pointer that can be used to move objects into standard threads. So that works. Uh, so signals work, start work, everything works just ex as expected. And that's extremely good news. We, so, uh, how about synchronization primitives? Uh, the situation is a bit strange. That is, we got a few classes in Qt and many more in the standard, and some of these are actually C17 classes. So for, instead of just one generic mutex, mutex class, the standard library is four, depending whether you need timed mutexes or recursive mutexes. In Qt, we don't do that. There is no standard library equivalent for semaphores. I don't know why. Looks like I just missed it. Uh, there are shared mutexes. There are weight, weight conditions and condition variables. In Qt, we don't have anything like call once, which is a, which is a way to guarantee that one function gets called exactly once. Uh, and the standard does not have anything like QGlobal static, because QGlobal static does not make any sense in C11. So in practice, you may decide to prepare a, a, a bit of remarks. Uh, Olivier has spent a lot of time ensuring that QMutex and QRed write lock are faster than the standard equivalent for some reason. A non recursive QMutex uh, is pretty safe. On Linux, uh, we are going to use uh, few texts, so fast user space, user space mutexes. So it's very fast, never allocates memory, and never throws exceptions, unlike standard mutex. Uh, um, we can mix and match QMutex and standard lock managers, uh, etc. So we, we got a bit of things going on, and yes, QGlobal static uh, these days is not useful whatsoever because thread safe function statics implement exact what QGlobal static tries to do. And I think I'm running out of time. I don't know. Well, okay, just finally, again, another collection of classes. We got the Qt lock managers. We also got the standard library lock managers. Which one is better? Uh, the standard library ones. Period, end of the story. We got uh, something that Qt is missing, such as movable lock guards, so I can return a lock which is already locked. Uh, the lock managers also have the timed try locks, so try to lock this lock for a period and give up. And also we got tag classes that decide what these managers should do with a lock. So I create a manager, I give it a lock, and I tell the manager, look, the lock is already locked. Don't try to relock it, you're going to that lock yourself. Or don't try to lock it just yet. I'll create it yourself in an unlocked state. And in C17, we also got something very fancy, which is lock guard managing multiple locks. So I can have, multi if I need to acquire multiple mutexes, I must be very sure when I do that because that's the perfect recipe of that locking. If one thread acquires mutexes in one order and another thread tries to do the same and tries to acquire them in another order, then the two are going to deadlock. That's pretty much guaranteed. 
So in C++, we got LockGuard, which solves this problem by using uh, the standard lock algorithm, which is not in Qt. Uh, in Qt, we just got uh, a very stupid Q-ordered Mudex locker class, which just does for two, not for more than that. So general the standard library alternatives are much better. And finally, Atomix, we got some in Qt. We got some in the standard library. Actually, we got anything in the standard library can be put as an argument of standard atomic, so I can make anything atomic. In practice, this means either your CPU supports that particular data type or it's going to put locks around it. What the standard library provides, in addition to Qt, are the atomic operations. So I have standard atomic store and a parameter which is generic. So I can write template generic code that deals with any kind of thing that can that you call store upon. Uh, so the worst story is this: that since 5.7, since Qt 5.7 requires C++ 11 support, then we decided yes, let's use their atomics because they're just better. The compilers recognize them, the tooling rec recognizes them, uh, except for Microsoft because Microsoft does not care about standards. So. Uh, they don't implement C++11 atomics properly. And the standard atomics, in case you're willing to eat this, uh, support, still support a couple of extra features that Qt ones are missing. Uh, notably the consume and acquire release memory ordering. Well, I know there is no compiler using consume, but it's there. And also the different memory orderings when you fail a read, modify, write operation. So you can have a test and set and do. And when it fails, do something with a given memory ordering, when it succeeds, do something else with a different memory ordering. Okay. And yes, and last bit really, thread local storage. We got Qt thread storage in Qt, and we got thread local in Sata library, they do the same thing. <laughs> they really do the same thing. Same functionality, different syntaxes. Uh, both are lazy initialized, and actually Qt thread storage has a way to check if it got something or not. So sorry, I'm running over time, questions? Yes. So I think you've uh, made it one primitive and you've done it on purpose, which is QFuture. And on Friday we had a quick talk about uh, the called future of the QFuture. And it talk, this talk depicted why QFuture in current state is broken, but the, it hasn't really answered the question what the QFuture of what the future of Q future is. So do you have any insight what's where it's going to? Is it going to be improved? Like, is, it, is there going to be a Q promise which we can use to create Q future someone else will get synchronized upon? Okay, uh, is even in the audience? Maybe not. I mean, uh, so uh, it's just reference another talk that happened, I think, yesterday about Q future. Uh, I, um, I don't think that anything at all is going to happen to Q future. That is going to stay around forever in the current state because we cannot break its API or its ABI compatibility. Uh, yes, now we got Q, we got standard future in the standard library. And that has a much more powerful API, et cetera, et cetera. So I would expect, uh, I mean, if you need a, few, a general purpose future class, please use the one from the standard. As of today, QFuture is useless uh, outside the Qt concurrent. Although the future, the, the sign pattern behind a QFuture is generic, it does not apply to just threads. Uh, it just represents this is something you will get eventually. Uh, in the current state, I don't expect QFuture to evolve unless, again, Ivan takes charge of the Qt concurrent module and fixes it, which I don't see happening anytime soon. Uh, because it's a bigger effort. So if you need that, please use standard future, standard promise, package task, all the things that the standard library already provides, and it's better than Qt at the moment. So, yeah. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah, okay. Um, is it safe to uh, connect signals between standard threads, or should it, is it something we should not do? So to connect signal uh, emitted between, from a standard thread? Yeah, and and have the slot in another standard thread. Yes, it's totally safe. I got a, a slide for this. Yes. All right. So you can, uh, here, signals can be emitted from, yes. Uh, it's totally safe to have uh, signals going both into and out a standard thread. Uh, out, there is no problem. In, it means you will need a local Q event loop because the signal targeting another thread will, will be delivered as an event for that thread, so you will need to run a Q event loop. 
for that, but everything, uh, it works. It already works, so you can do that. Hi. Hi, um, oh, sorry. Concerning that uh, standard atomics, um, if I'm compiling with the MinGW, is that uh, working, or is it the general Microsoft problem? Oh, okay, that's a good question. Uh, to be honest, I don't know because I don't compile, I haven't compiled with MinGW for a very long right. time. Uh, it might be, it's just a matter that somewhere in Qt there is a compiler detection and if it's right. MSVC then uses the Qt own implementation of Atomics. If it's anything else, it's uh, standard Atomics. Uh, it's, I, I can check the code, I, <laughs> I know where the check is, I just don't remember if MingW right. is right. in or out that check. All right. uh, the whole thing is actually very, very thin if you want, which is, where is that? Uh, it's that uh, I think the constructor of the atomics are not constacts from Microsoft or something all like right, that. All right. It's really they forgot to add a feature that we need. Okay. So we implemented it ourselves. Thanks. Okay, you're welcome. All right, thank you very much. Um, uh, there are some other questions, but we need to go. There I mean, there's lunch outside, so I'm here for questions. If you want to leave uh, for lunch, I don't know. Oh, there is another one in the back. Okay, really, really last, 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 right, last one. Really, really the last yeah. one. So I'm going back to questions. Um, if, I, if I move an object from one thread to another and I have still pending events in my event queue, do I take them with me or do they just yeah, get thrown away once they the, get scheduled or, or does it cause a problem or what may happen? I'm sorry, to get the first part of your question. Uh, if there are pending events to be delivered to an object when it gets moved between threads, do they run? Exactly. Yes. So when you move an object between threads, all the pending events for that object are carried along with it and moved into the other, the targets, the target threads event loop. So everything works, yes. Uh, if you talk about paint events, I'm thinking you're moving widgets, which you're not allowed to do in any case. Uh, <laughs> you're not allowed to touch widgets, move them, but apart from that, uh, any event which was pending in the event loop for, for, the, for that object will be carried alongside with the object. So you, you will not lose anything along the way. Uh, yeah. So that's it, I think. That's so it. Then our future okay. contains one. So thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>